Coming up, the work at the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center is all about addressing domestic violence. We'll meet the chairwoman who advocates for mothers and children. Plus, a native-owned brewing company with a major league baseball team. And happy birthday, ICT. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Ahmed Awahopa, thank you for joining us. We start in Rome, where indigenous leaders and residential school survivors held a historic meeting with Pope Francis. On Monday, the Pope met with Métis and Inuit delegations. According to the president of the Métis National Council, Cassidy Karen, the Pope listened intently to the stories of three survivors. He reportedly showed sorrow but did not offer an immediate apology. A mental health counselor was in the room for Monday's session. The rescheduled meeting in Vatican City was postponed from December due to COVID-19. After the meeting, Karen said, While the time for acknowledgement, apology, and atonement is long overdue, it is never too late to do the right thing. The Pope will meet with the delegation of First Nations people on Thursday. On Friday, he will address all of the delegations where he is expected to deliver an address. And ICT will continue to follow the coverage of this historic visit. To find out more information, visit IndianCountryToday.com or visit our partners at APTN News in Canada. After days of hearings, there are no major changes to the way herring fish are harvested in Sitka, Alaska. Clinket people have warned for years that commercial fishing is depleting the source of herring. They've said they want to see changes in the way commercial fishing outfits are regulated. The Alaska Journal of Commerce reports the Southeast Herring Conservation Alliance, which represents commercial fisheries, says it will work with the tribe to mitigate the issues. And now both sides are dealing with an oil spill 15 miles northwest of Sitka. A tugboat towing a larger ship ran aground last week. State biologists say as much as 45,000 gallons of fuel could be leaking into the water. And there is no word on when the Alliance and the Sitka tribe will announce new regulations. Hereditary chiefs, land defenders, and now A-list entertainers are helping First Nations citizens fight pipeline projects. In Canada, Wasoatan people continue to fight against the natural gas pipeline being constructed by company Coastal Gas Link. And now actor Mark Ruffalo is leading a campaign to help First Nations unceded territories in northern British Columbia. The performer says this is the same fight as the one against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Honestly, it had all the contours of, um, of Standing Rock. It was the same fight. And it's the same fight that's happening all over the world with indigenous people standing um, for our mother earth and our clean water and air and our fellow humanity. And, and most importantly, the next seven generations. In November, Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrested and jailed dozens of land defenders along with journalists at Wasoatan resistance camps. In California, the Yurok Tribe and the Major League Baseball team, the San Francisco Giants, are partnering together to sell three craft beers. It's the first partnership of its kind, and the beer will be coming from a brewery owned by the Yurok Tribe. Linda Cooley is the CEO of Mad River Brewing Company. She says it's nice to be taken seriously in this business. It's one of those things that you think is never going to happen. We're never going to be at that level of recognition or taken seriously seems like we're either tokenized or only consider for casinos or funny 
I mean, so to be taken seriously and have someone actually care about what we're fighting for on top of supporting our sovereignty with supporting our businesses, it's just unbelievable. The deal will last for two years and the drinks will be sold across multiple locations in the stadium. Around the stadium, fans will also be able to see the Mad River Brewing logo on neon signs. And we'll have more on this story later in our newscast. Coming up, we celebrate an important milestone for this Indigenous news source. But first, we meet the chairwoman of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Stay with us. All month, we featured amazing Native women as we celebrate Women's History Month. Today, we are turning our focus on the chairwoman of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. This nonprofit was created to help address the high rates of domestic violence against Indigenous women and their children. Shara Giles is Muskogee and Cherokee. She is serving her second term as chairwoman of the Resource Center, and she joins us today. Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Shara. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be with you today. So you've had a long career of service to your nation. Tell us what first got you started. Uh, what first got me started, of course, uh, working for my own tribal nation and the just Indian country as a whole is really what my tribe has done for me as a student, as a, a young mother. I was a teenage mom. And so having those opportunities given to me um, to be able to continue my schooling, uh, for my family to be housed, do housing programs. It was just one way for me to give back. And um, at 16, I had my first daughter and she was born with Down syndrome. And so that trajectory of my life of giving back and really trying to find my purpose and find, make sure that she has a place in this world. It was just really drove me to just continue to do what I can, even with um, challenging circumstances sometimes. A large part of your service to your nation was the fact that you were um, you were a social worker. Um, I'd love for you to talk more about that and maybe what the most rewarding part of that work was for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, as a teenage mom, I was really focused on and not knowing that she was going to have Down syndrome. Um, was really trying to set up my, I was still in high school, so I set taking all the classes. I was really wanting to be a physical therapist and started taking my math and sciences. And somewhere midstream before my daughter was born, it was just like, this isn't who I am. And um, social work really started to have a calling. And then after my daughter was born, having all the social workers um, that were helping me get access services for her and people ask me, well, what does your tribe offer for people with special needs? What um, can you do? And it really started to open my eyes, like what are tribal communities doing for people with special needs? And just getting me thinking about a lot of different things. And again, as a teenage mom, um, all the support services I had in place. So going to school um, and pursuing that degree in social work and still not exactly sure like what area um, I wanted to focus on, but saying there was such a need out there in Indian country and in our communities you know, finding a job wasn't going to be hard. Um, that and that's unfortunate. Um, but at least, at least I can come with from my background and my tribal community and just continue to elevate those voices that aren't often often heard. Um, and so, being a social worker just it led me to a lot of different um, areas, from child welfare to running twelve tribal program direct service programs for my own tribal nation. And now I am a licensed master social worker working in behavioral health for behavioral health and wellness program. Um, so the highlight really has just been working for Indian country and really having the opportunities to work in different areas and that um, really affect where I, you know, in my own personal journey as well, the things that, that matter to me and just, again, elevating those voices. You were the youngest person to be elected to your tribal council at age 24. When you're looking back at that experience, how do you characterize what that was like? Man, I was really brave. <laughs> at that time, I really thought to myself, 
I can do this. I, I, you know, I, I had a master's degree. I also had three kids at that point and I was pregnant with my fourth child. And I, I just, at the time, just felt fearless like this. This wasn't something that was too far out of reach. This wasn't something that wasn't unreasonable. And at that time for my tribal council, um, we're the fourth largest tribe in the United States, the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, it just felt like this is a way I can give back, but it also wasn't a full-time job. It didn't come with benefits. So I was getting an $800 a month stipend. So I still had to work full-time, attend my council meetings, um, be a part of active in my community. So being a working mom and a career woman and just you know coming out of my master's program, it was, again, it was a way to say, I can do all of these things and do them well. And the use of technology, you know, cell phones were coming out more, more emails, more internet when I first got on council. So even opening those opportunities to say, I can I can still be accessible and take care of the things I need to take care of in my home, as well as for my tribal community and then my professional career as well. You know, times feel really hard right now. We are recovering from COVID-19. There's uh, this looming feeling of uh, of war now that we're watching what's going on in Ukraine. When you're talking to young people, what advice do you have to them to want to give back to their community and maybe just don't know where to start? Yeah, absolutely. Just starting small. You know, the world does seem like a big place. Um, and things may seem out of our control and that we don't have any say or any voice, but just create and then creating those opportunities. I always say this for especially for young people as adults, adult aged people, we got to help create those opportunities and get out of their, you know, young people's way as well. I have adult aged children in their early 20s and um, I know they're still finding their way, but I also have to be able to say, okay, here's some opportunities. Here's, you know, have you considered this? Have you looked at this? And then the work that I'm doing in behavioral health and wellness um, is for bureau operated funded schools. And so we're looking at ways to connect again through social media, through the ways that we're not able to travel and meet in person, but really continuing um, to share their the, what, what young people are doing. You know, we see this abundance of TikTok videos and these young influencers. So promoting them and sharing their information uh, and showing and highlighting them what they're doing in their own tribal communities as well. Shara, we only have a short time left, but I've been asking all of the women who have joined us for Women's History Month, who are women that they admire in their own lives? So I'd love to ask you that question. Of course. Yeah, of course, it always goes back to our mothers and grandmothers, typically. And um, for me, it's also my children, my daughter that has Down syndrome. She's also she's 28 now. And that girl, that woman is the light of my life. I mean, just what she's overcome and what she sees and what and how she pursues and takes everyday life. I mean, she really helps me every day reframe what I'm doing and my purpose here. Um, and of course, just the Indian women leaders across Indian country, of course, being Cherokee, Wilma Mankiller was one of my, my first um, idols. But so just, you know, it, all ages of women, I would say too, it's not those that have come before me and not people that I've just, only people I've met, but then people I've read about and watched and learned. So um, I've been, very fortunate to have a whole line of women around me, a whole um, warrior women um, around me in all of my work in my family and personal life as well. Well, Shara, thank you so much for being here and for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mado. As we mentioned earlier in our newscast, a native-owned brewing company has created a first-of-its-kind partnership with the Major League Baseball team. ICT reporter and producer Callie Benali recently profiled the Mad River Brewing Company, and she joins us now to share more about what she learned. Hi, Callie. Great to see you. Hi, Aaliyah. Good to see you. So this company was started just a few years ago. Tell us how it went from being started to now having this partnership with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, well, the Yurok tribe uh, bought the 
uh, the brewery in 2019 before the pandemic happened. And um, they were already looking to rebrand, but they had to pause for a little while. And then not until recently, uh, last year, they just found somebody on LinkedIn who had the connections to the Giants and they got the got to the right person and the Giants responded quickly and the deal just uh, came about really fast. I understand you actually spoke to the leader of the Mad River Brewing Company. Tell us about that. Um, yes, yeah, so she just spoke to me about the trajectory of when she bought the when the tribe bought the company in 2019 and where she sees it today. So um, here's what she had to say. It's been incredible. I've known this brand my whole career. I've pulled against them and they were always known for just quality. They had the best beer. Um, they had a great company culture. And for us to get the opportunity to take that to the next level and to tell our story, it's one of those things that's just unimaginable that that could ever happen and have a vessel that we can put into these stores for other people to touch and see and get our story out there. Um, we purchased this at the most, un, <laughs> just the craziest time. We purchased it three or four weeks before COVID happened. But it's been amazing to have that pause to rebrand and talk to other people who are doing something similar and to create something bigger than just beer outside of quality craft beer to have a story and a celebration that we can all share and just something positive. And now that we're seeing a, a hope that maybe we're in a different time period where we're not super concerned all the time about our health, be able to share that on a broader level and our team here to be able to speak about what we're doing, it's incredible. It's, it's nothing I ever thought would be possible. And Callie, how were these drinks chosen um, for the stadium, for the, the stadium to be selling them? Um, well, the, the Giants were, the, um, were to select the three drinks, and, um, but two of them are pretty important to the tribe. Um, the Historic State Park IPA, it uh, highlights the tribe's partnership with California State Parks to return indigenous names to the parks. And then they have undammed huckleberry hot hard seltzer. And that one represents the tribe's work to remove the dams uh, on Klamath River, which the tribe is in the area. Um, and huckleberry being indigenous to the Humboldt County and the Yurok, and what the Yurok tribe has um, eaten for a very long time. You know, when I was reading this story, one of the most surprising parts to me was that um, the San Francisco Giants have already implemented um, other ways for Native folks who are watching the game and other people, of course, to really feel safe at Giants Stadium. Um, tell us more about that. Um, well, the reason Linda Cooley chose um, or wanted to work with the Giants was that exactly is how inclusive they were. They have a Native American Heritage Night and they've had that for over a decade. And um, there was an incident in 2014 and where fans, Native American fans were unhappy with the Giants and how in the response to the security team. So the Giants implemented a text messaging system where um, there's signs in the stadium where you can text a number and there will be a swift response from the security. And also they have LGBTQ night and they also have until there's a cure um, event, which raises awareness for HIV and AIDS. Did Linda Cooley at all talk about um, if she hopes that this partnership will span to other teams for other native owned brewing companies? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she's um, looking forward to possibly doing this for the NFL and um, yeah, and just expanding this. And she is in talks with another professional team, um, but she can't reveal who it is, but she expects to hopefully announce that this year. Your story uh, was filed on Monday and it hit our website, of course. Since then, what has been the reaction from readers when they've learned about this news? I think they were mostly congratulatory. Um, again, it's, it is a recent story, so we'll see how the, the response comes in. Callie, while we have you here, um, what other stories are you working on and what can we expect to see next from you? Um, well, I'm doing a profile on our new 
a political correspondent, uh, Polly Denekla. So you'll hear more about her position and her past experience and how excited she is to work for ICT. Sure. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thank you, Callie. Thank you. This week marks an anniversary for ICT. One year ago, the National Congress of American Indians transferred its ownership of our news company to Indige Public Media, which is an independent nonprofit media company based in Arizona. It's been a remarkable journey that started in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, 40 years ago, with stops in New York and Washington, D.C. Mark Trahant celebrates another anniversary. Four years ago, he was hired by NCAI to bring ICT back to life after the Oneida Indian Nation ceased publication in September of 2017. Welcome, Mark. Glad to be here. So take us through the short history, of course, of the last 40 years of Indian country today. Well, I mean, it was really remarkable. It started as a private sector newspaper, uh, Tim Gallego on uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And his vision was a weekly newspaper serving Lakota people it expanded nationally and became Indian country today. And a couple of years after that, uh, Tim decided to sell it. And he sold it to the Oneida Indian Nation in New York State. And uh, for a while, they moved the offices first to Oneida and then to New York City. They became a magazine. They um, published all sorts of things uh, and kept expanding. And then in September 2017, they decided that the market wasn't supporting that and pulled out. And uh, it went dark for uh, several months. And in February of 2018, uh, Jackie uh, Peta, who was then the executive director of NCAI, announced that the Oneida Indian Nation had donated the assets to NCAI. They hired me to restart it. And uh, the rest is history. You know, in that little lull when uh, Indian Country Today ceased publication, it really seemed like there was a real uh, missing asset for Indigenous news. Can you reflect on that time and maybe what we lost when that went dark? Yeah, I think people realized immediately how much had been lost. And one of the ones that get me is that something like uh, 5,000 people a day were looking at a website that was dormant. And they were just hungry for news and trying to find out things. What makes this chapter of ICT so remarkable is unlike any other era, we're run by journalists. Um, that was true of Tim Gallego, but the other factor is we're also a nonprofit. We're not in this to make money. We're actually a public service and our entire existence is about public service. Tell our audience more about our parent company, Indige Public Media, which was started a year ago and tell, tell them the saga of how that came to be. Sure. Um, I think from the beginning, we knew that there was going to be a tough relationship with NCAI in that, um, I mean, it's funny, if you go back and look at the first plan, uh, NCAI asked for money from tribes for ICT and its public relations campaign, and it saw them kind of as left-hand, right-hand type of thing. And it was pretty clear right away that that wasn't going to work. And journalists are just ornery, and we have our own way of doing things. And the other thing is we tend to move fast. Um, any organization that deals with political issues has a process to go through. And we're like lightning. I mean, something happens, we want to post it now. And those two things were just irreconcilable. So we started looking for a way out of that. And it became clear that it was going to have to be some sort of hybrid. Originally, there was going to be an NCAI-owned Indian country today that would be separate. And I think that's when we started thinking about what structure would work best. And Indig Public Media was our creation for that. And um, I'm one of the few people that can say I hired my own boss. Uh, I brought in Karen Michelle to run the company and she's just done a phenomenal job and uh, really set out a vision for Indig Public Media. And I think one of the telling, well, there are two things that I think are really telling. 
One, and we haven't announced this yet, so you're breaking it on IC2 Newscast. Uh, we have a million dollar grant coming from the Bay and Paul Foundation, which is just remarkable and shows how far we've come in a lot of ways. And the second thing is that last year, uh, we thought we were being pretty aggressive and budgeted uh, 200,000 from individuals, from people just writing us small checks. And the average check we get is $35. And we ended the year at $340,000. And I think that's a real testament to one, the width of support, the depth of support from Indian country. I just want to make sure that I'm being crystal clear. So we can think of Indige Public Media as the sort of umbrella of uh, the this media company, which owns ICT Newscast and the ICT website. Is that correct? That's correct. And maybe down the road, Indige Public Media will own more things than that. Well, one of our visions, and I'll, I'll just be real honest about this here, is I would love to see the day when Indigenous media owns non-Indian media and uh, owning something that has nothing to do with Indian country, but just to own it so that we can say, uh, we have a say in the overall ecosystem of media. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being here and for breaking all of that down for us. Delighted. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For more news, visit indiancountrytoday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run.